Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Ivan diaz Reni. Uh, so I'm co-director of the Otago Energy Research Center along with uh, Michael Jack. Uh, so that's, that's my night job. My day job is uh, Associate Professor of Finance. Um, so those of you that are new to our OERC, welcome. Uh, we're a network at the university that looks, uh, well, it's very cross-disciplinary. Uh, we're all interested in energy issues. And today is our, our fourth or fifth seminar of the year, probably our fifth at least. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Jeremiah Deng and Sophia Sayiri. Um, and so Jeremiah has recently joined our steering group, um, and he's in info science, but you've been at Otago a long time. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's the great thing about OERC. We, you know, because we're a network, we rely on, 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 on people joining us because it, invariably in universities people move on or retire. Um, so, you know, if you are interested in, in joining OERC, if you're faculty, uh, do get in touch. Uh, if you're students, uh, we can add you to the distribution list. Um, and at the back, no, here at the front, we have a, a list where you can sign up and, and give us your name and we can make sure you're added to the distribution list. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I will uh, let Jeremiah and uh, Sophie uh, take over. They're gonna be talking about engaging machine learning and energy data modeling and si system optimization. Uh, so we look forward to your talk, welcome. Thank you, Thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for coming uh, for today's uh, talk. Um, so I'm Jeremiah Deng. Uh, I'm an associate, associate professor in um, information science. And together with uh, Dr. Brendan Woodford and some other colleagues, we run the uh, ICOM lab, which is uh, uh, intelligent computing and networking lab uh, in the information science research. Uh, <coughs> so, yeah, um, so we have 59 slides, but <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we can make it, but some of them are actually uh, animation numbers, so it's not really number of slides. So, uh, so what I'll do, I'll quickly give a brief introduction to the history of machine learning and why it's actually making such a big noise uh, these days. Uh, and then we uh, I'll talk about some of the active, recent activities we are involved in, uh, basically by, uh, in applying machine learning techniques uh, in analyzing uh, energy data and also optimizing uh, energy systems. Uh, so then we'll share some uh, preliminary uh, work we have already done. Uh, <clears throat> so one is on anomaly detection of household uh, power consumption. Uh, Another is actually very revolutionary in a sense, because uh, yeah, Sophie will talk about the recent research on uh, modeling um, uh, sports gears that runs entirely by uh, energy harvesting from uh, kinetics. Okay. This is not run by uh, batteries at all. Uh, so that's some theoretical based uh, exploration. So I think that uh, hasn't been done, so it's like quite some exciting outcome we've got. And then we'll, we'll share, if time permits, uh, uh, after Sophie's um, talk, I'll actually go back and share some recent results we obtained uh, through using computational intelligence techniques to optimize uh, uh, coalition formation uh, in smart grids. Okay. That's basically the layout for today's talk. Um, yeah, I guess we're all familiar with machine learning and uh, the recently the, the media coverage of uh, AlphaGo has, seems to uh, uh, suggest that you know, machine learning has suddenly become a revolutionary solution of everything and will replace uh, mankind, mankind uh, in many, many things. Uh, uh, so I sort of have a disclaimer, uh, I'm not going to promote uh, machine learning that way. Uh, as I, uh, I will show you is that it's more or less a you know, progressive and, and in a sense incremental advances uh, machine learning actually has been uh, going through over the years. Okay. Uh, if you take a look closer look at all these uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, three major um, branches or three or four branches of machine learning, unsupervised learning in dealing with Data clustering um, for dimension reduction. Uh, we are 
may be quite familiar with the uh, class we have with the Ukrainians. It's actually uh, uh, promote, pro uh, proposed by McKay back in the 1960s. Uh, and the very influential work by uh, Benster on uh, expectation maximization in algorithm actually dated back to 1977. Um, the very popular uh, principal component analysis algorithm uh, is actually invented by Pearson <coughs> in 1901. So, <laughs> so maybe, and also the uh, multi-dimensional scaling uh, such as uh, Samuel's mapping is uh, quite popular in, uh, in, in science uh, domain as well. Uh, actually it's 1968, okay. Um, even though we have a uh, newer method, we can see that it's actually more, more, more or less an extension of this existing uh, uh, similar work. Uh, in terms of classification and uh, regression, uh, it's the so-called supervised learning. Uh, we know the Bayes theorem uh, is actually uh, because of the uh, uh, nearing work done by um, Reverend Thomas Bayes back in the 18th century. Uh, the very famous perceptual algorithm by Rosenblatt <coughs> uh, is actually invented in 1967. Okay. If we go a little bit uh, sideways, uh, there's also an influential uh, kind of branch of uh, machine learning research is called semi-supervised learning. And I'll uh, actually share a little bit uh, on that direction. Is that it's more, more or less used for anomaly detection, outline detection, and that's very useful techniques. And Parson and others basically developed kernel uh, density estimation techniques in the 1960s as well. And the very reason, uh, the very kind of fundamental algorithm driving the success of DeepMind. Uh, framework such as AlphaGo uh, is basically central and also the Q learning. So Q learning is much younger, uh, is it? but even that is actually uh, 30 years old. Uh, so why suddenly machine learning has become such a, uh, a big splash, maybe, maybe such a big splash? Uh, I think it's more or less related to other technology advances. Uh, so with the availability of um, big data uh, pushed by internet technology, by message, massive digitization and storage uh, mechanisms, devices, and also all these computing devices, computing facilities are getting cheaper and cheaper. So all these factors contribute to the uh, recent, uh, in a sense, sort of hype of machine learning. But uh, on, in another sense, this is uh, the current development of machine learning stems from very, very solid research work done over the years uh, from uh, statistics, from computational uh, learning theory in computer science, and also uh, from pattern recognition, as more or less in the electric, electronic engineering community. So all these different fields contribute towards the uh, current uh, sudden flourish of uh, machine learning technologies. Um, so in a sense, what I'm going to present is also uh, incremental. <laughs> it's not really revolutionary uh, in any sense, uh, but somehow I'll, I'll try to show that we can actually make some differences by using uh, these machine learning techniques. Uh, so on that note, I want to introduce my lab. Uh, so we are the Intelligent Computing Networking Lab. I apologize for the uh, old photo. Uh, it's probably taken three years ago. So, so Sophie is not on it. Arma is not on it. Uh, uh, Hunter is already um, uh, has already left us uh, to, to do a postdoc in Germany, and uh, Muni is working in statistics. Statistics Museum, so we'll try to uh, get in touch with them, get more data from. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's nice to have uh, graduates working with people in places. So, yeah, um, so uh, we're also collaborating uh, 
chosen these people in computer science. Uh, it was Haibo Zhang, uh, also from uh, uh, geography as well. Uh, yeah, so we were seeking more collaborations with that um, different part. Of, uh, okay, um, so especially in recent years, we sort of also um, uh, want to uh, apply or we see this potential of applying machine learning techniques uh, onto energy data. Okay, and uh, we feel that uh, there's also a convergence because uh, networking is actually uh, consumes power. Uh, on the other hand, it actually exchanges data and also makes potentially computing and communication more efficient. So I, we, we feel like the computing uh, and also communication, energy consumption, they're all kind of integrated uh, together. Now, uh, if you want to optimize one thing, you have to consider the other aspects as well. So that's why we, we sort of actually started to think about uh, basically tackling these optimization problems from a more systematic way. And uh, so uh, early, Last year, uh, Michael Major, he was in touch. He was actually to speak today, <laughs> but he couldn't make it, so that's why I stayed in. Uh, so he was saying, okay, uh, uh, are you interested in actually uh, co-organizing something? Because uh, he noticed some, some of our recent work as well. So we actually put in a proposal uh, for a computational intelligence in renewable energy uh, session session uh, on IES. Uh, which is a uh, Pacific uh, Asia kind of regional conference on using uh, computational intelligence for yeah and techniques and also applications. So yeah, that proposal got accepted, but unfortunately, we might have picked the wrong conference. Uh, I can't say that we are too ahead of the time <laughs> because right in the same year. Uh, Another proposal we, we submitted to ICBM, which is a top conference in data mining, uh, I got accepted and also attract quite a few papers as well. Uh, so that that didn't happen. The special session didn't happen, but the uh, workshop on data mining for energy modeling and optimization uh, was a, was a, actually a quite encouraging success for us. Uh, so over the years we've been published on uh, a few workshops and international conferences, notably the IGC and uh, uh, a ERA a -A conference as well. So welcome to Mark for that. Um, we also um, got invited to um, co-edit a, um, a special issue on the wireless communication and mobile computing journal. So there's any uh, uh, make it happen for uh, uh, next year. So that's our sort of energy related footprint. Yeah. Uh, elsewhere, we, this uh, growing tendency actually, uh, uh, you see people actually see the uh, potential of integrating machine learning with energy related research. Okay. So there are a number of uh, special issues and also. Uh, uh, special uh, workshops or sessions proposed. And, um, uh, so these first two, I, uh, we take a look and it's found that it's more like um, uh, engineering oriented. Uh, it's not really uh, using machine learning or, or focusing on machine learning that much. Uh, the third one, uh, the BEAR uh, workshop, is, looks quite interesting. Um, and um, we submitted a, a paper to ICON 2017. Uh, so hopefully we'll find out how, how relevant that uh, special session we actually have uh, hosted, co-organized by some Chinese uh, researchers there. So we'll be interested to see what's going on there. So obviously it's actually uh, a growing research focus uh, being developed uh, along these lines. I like to highlight a few papers uh, we, we had uh, from the Adam uh, Memo, uh, data mining for energy modeling and optimization, uh, held in Barcelona in the last year. 
So many of these papers are basically focusing on using neural networks or other machine learning techniques. What do we actually do? Get rid of that uh, shadow. Can't really do it. Okay, no, it's gone. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so many, most of the, these papers are focusing on the uh, prediction side. Okay. Uh, the only exception is uh, the second one is actually looking into the uh, similarity of uh, power plants and actually try to group, uh, group them uh, by using clustering algorithm. Uh, the fourth one, which is my own paper, <laughs> I, I might be a little bit um, embarrassed <laughs> because I'm not the organizer and also <laughs> uh, I have to declare that there's no conflict of interest here. Uh, we have three, uh, three coaches. Uh, and the papers are double blindly reviewed, <laughs> and the decision was made by the other teachers. <laughs> okay. And for, fortunately, my paper is uh, uh, probably the, the top uh, scope one. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I shouldn't, shouldn't much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, this one is, I actually talk a bit further uh, uh, in detail uh, soon. It looks into the uh, anomaly detection algorithm. Uh, so uh, that's it. So um, let's get into this one. Uh, it's actually a very, very simple idea, uh, uh, but uh, it actually turns out to be quite effective in our uh, preliminary study. It's a toy, sort of a toy problem. Okay. Um, so outlier detection has been a basically an old topic. Okay. Um, uh, but it actually has some very important uh, applications maybe you can actually use this, uh, uh, these algorithms to like detect uh, household consumption anomalies. You can actually find um, uh, abnormal behaviors in uh, and, uh, video surveillance, uh, or uh, you can actually monitor in a smart home. Uh, so I might be working on that uh, using analyzing the sensor readings. You can actually detect abnormal behaviors within house with, um, so that may actually help uh, uh, better looking after the, the elderly people uh, who live alone uh, so uh, yeah and uh, back in 2014 looking, looking for the uh, evolving patterns of wind speed data uh, so yeah potentially it, it, we can find a lot of applications uh, to that uh, uh, how to do these um, Online detection, especially with uh, online stream data. Okay, so data actually flowing piece by piece, and you have to adapt your computing model uh, progressively. Okay, you don't have to actually grab a lot of data and actually uh, generate some really, really um, complicated training, going, going through some really, really complicated and time consuming training process. And then the new batch uh, data comes in and uh, makes your old training model entirely obsolete. Okay. So we want to actually construct some adaptive model um, that continuously learn uh, from the incoming data piece by piece. So in a sense, it's kind of incremental, it's online learning. So that's always a challenge. So over the years, um, uh, people actually propose different, uh, like it can be classification, uh, oriented based methods or uh, can be clustering based algorithm. Uh, so we have to look into uh, a deviation based uh, method by looking to the perturbation, sorry, perturbation of uh, in the eigen space. As we're looking at the eigen vectors, how they actually deviate from the original position to a new position. If it's too much deviation, you can actually uh, 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 set, set the alarm. And the sense of normal. Yeah. Um, so a little bit quick review about what PCA, uh, principal component analysis, is. Basically, we generate the covariance matrix of the input data. Okay. This is done, of course, in the batch mode. You have to get all the data pieces in and then generate the covariance matrix. And then you, you do um, eigen analysis so they can actually. Uh, 
derive that the uh, direction is okay, so vectors, and on, onto these vectors will generate the maximum variance. Okay, and often these are um, uh, principal component uh, or these uh, eigenvectors, they will um, actually generate really, really meaningful projections that will help with not only this uh, data compression, so this is a JPEG, MPEG uh, techniques we are using nowadays, uh, basically rely on this sort of PCA like similar techniques. Um, it also may generate uh, some useful features this is class one and, and class two after projection may be actually uh, quite well separated from each other. That will help with uh, uh, classification. However, um, that's all. so this algorithm is, of course, the traditional PCA, basically uh, done, as I mentioned, in the batch mode. How, how can we actually make it kind of online incremental? Uh, there is a recent paper by Li and others um, published in IEEE transaction of uh, knowledge, knowledge and data engineering. So it's a quite nice journal. So I read the paper and they said, okay, let's actually uh, give it to our uh, Info 411, which is a data, machine learning data mining uh, 400 level paper. So I gave it to the students and they actually did some experiment. It works really well. And I said, yeah, oh, that's nice. Uh, now that we can find a way to kind of um, incrementally adapt the R, the covariance matrix, okay, we keep with sort of when data samples come in one after another. And then you basically uh, evaluate the, the deviation of eigenvectors, right? and then you can basically uh, assess whether that's an anomaly or not. So that's, that was really nice. Okay. However, uh, PCA has um, it has been known that PCA has some drawback. So it's basically a linear transformation. Okay. So in situations like this, as you can see, whatever uh, whatever linear pro projection will cause all these uh, data groups of different classes, they sort of will generate overlap projection. So you can't really get a class one here, but there. Basically, they are they basically are, are squeezed into the same, uh, roughly the same region. So it's unlikely uh, for us to develop classification or so for the one classification, one class classification is that okay, here's normal class, everything outside it uh, should be at normal. Okay. Uh, so there's no clear boundary uh, we can actually obtain to near PCA. So what people um, came up with the idea is that to sort of kernel PCA is that we can uh, generate some nonlinear so-called kernel transformation. Okay, so we apply the, these kernel transformation, they actually become uh, spread out in a high dimensional space. So it's, what we have in the input signal might be uh, high dimensional array, okay. uh, but we can even actually project them into higher dimension. And then that will actually perhaps will generate some linear separate, separate, okay. separability. Yes, that's the way. Uh, however, there's a, a challenge here. Okay. Uh, the covariance matrix, of course, uh, dimensionality relates to the uh, is actually a crucial thing. Once the dimensionality gets bigger and bigger, uh, the eigen analysis is very, very time consuming. Thank you. So, however, um, with kernel PCA, it turns out that we don't have to do eigen analysis in the projection, uh, high dimensional projection space. Okay. What we could do is to actually do some kernel function. So that we can generate a kernel matrix by actually operating on data in the original data space. So relatively high dimensional. Okay. Now we once we have that K matrix, what we can do is do a very simple centralization operation. And then we do either analysis on this so-called kernel matrix. 
and then uh, normalization, then we can get the R bar, uh, which is the eigenvector. And then we can use the eigenvector to do uh, eigen to generate the projection in the high dimensional feature space. Okay. So it's some it's kind of it's kind of funny. Okay, you generate higher dimensional projection. Okay, however, your eigen analysis can be done in low dimensional space. Okay, so that actually is sort of a nice cheat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you can still uh, get the separability, linear separability of the patterns, and then that will actually allow uh, simple, simple uh, models uh, to be able to do anomaly detection or uh, classification. Now, there's an issue here. So my idea is that, okay, maybe, yeah, I can extend the uh, incremental PCA idea uh, and uh, apply kernel PCA on it, on it, okay. But there's an issue is that with the original linear model, what we could, could do is the R matrix, right? With the new input, what we need to do is basically Add it into, we generate the correlation and add it into the R matrix. Okay. So that can be easily done. So with the kernel PCA, um, the dimensionality of the kernel matrix is actually the number of data samples. Okay. By adding one sample, uh, that means you're, you actually grow on the dimensionality. So it's like uh, you. we were actually trying to figure out what is the best position on a two-dimensional space, you're trying to find the direction, and suddenly the data become three-dimensional. All these previ previous calculation, calculations done on the low-dimensional space doesn't make sense anymore. Okay. So, so we can't, I feel I can't go that way. Okay. Um, so what could be done, uh, so I basically took the closer look of this uh, K matrix, Okay, so I say, okay, if I replace one data item uh, with the current input, okay, what will actually change in the kernel matrix? Okay, so it turns out only the P, uh, if the, the, if the piece item that I want to replace, okay, if the code is match that I want to replace, then what's changed is only the case row and also the case. Sorry, the piece row and the piece column. Okay. Now, if the change is basically a small one uh, compared with the original item in each position, uh, I found that by doing the projection and the correlation with the item vector again, uh, if the epsilon i's are all very small, the deviation, deviation will be very small. So the correlation will still be one, okay, or basically very close to one. Okay. But if the replacement is actually a big change, okay, the deviation will actually be, be large. So it's probably uh, the idea is better explained by this. So for every XP, so if this green one, the new in, incoming signal, okay, I search around in the uh, in the pool, okay, and that is the closest match, okay, and the difference is actually quite small, okay, so that means very small changes to the k matrix, okay, and the uh, uh, deviation uh, made it calculated by this formula it will be very small. However, if it's an outlier, you search around in the pool, okay, the incoming data, the closest match is this one. However, the deviation is actually much larger. So that will of course much larger changes to the K matrix. Okay. So we will should result in real result in big changes. Okay. So that's basically the very simple, straightforward idea. So that's the algorithm. Uh, I have an option is that if this XP, uh, the data sample under replacement is close enough, and I think that maybe it's getting out of date as well, I can actually replace it with a new input. Okay. So once a new input comes in, I can always replace it with 
some something new newer. Okay, so the pool gets updated all the way. So that's basically an uh, optional operation that comes in. But it will actually generate some a slight difference into the performance as well. So how do I actually derive the threshold? Uh, so what I do is basically a simple generate the histogram of the deviations and then basically cut on a certain percentage. Uh, in this case, it's ninety percent percentage. It works pretty well. So this is basically done on some toy problem. Um, so I use some uh, uh, sorry some data set from the uh, UCI machine learning repository, basically some, some standard data sets are available on the internet. And uh, what I can see here that uh, with the incremental PCA, uh, it's actually relatively stable uh, using um, smaller uh, learning rate. Okay. So as you can see, uh, there's horizontally there's a force positive rate, horizontal, so vertically is a uh, true positive rate, that's basically true positive means that if it's an anomaly, it is reported as an anomaly. False positive means that it is not an anomaly, but somehow you are going to say it is. Okay. So obviously, uh, this way, up on the vertical direction and not going to the right direction, these regions are the good regions for a, a, a classified performance. Okay. So as you can see, smaller learning rates, they pretty much uh, end up over there. Okay. So this is basically some uh, standard way of actually evaluating algorithms performances, basically generally so-called internal um, characteristics occurring. And you calculate the area under that curve. So it is called ABC. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here's a, the, uh, the uh, experiment I did the real uh, household uh, power consumption data. Um, I'm actually too much time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be pretty quick now. Uh, so this is basically uh, 24 hours uh, household consumption. Um, you can visualize it by uh, eight by six bit map. So roughly seven o'clock uh, to eight, uh, six to seven, eight o'clock, six to seven, right? Kind of like uh, everybody uh, wakes up and uh, cooks breakfast, and uh, five o'clock, uh, and then eight o'clock. So it will be uh, uh, dinner time, uh, showering, whatsoever. Yeah. So these are the uh, hot spots. Okay. So on, on the right, you see these different patterns, quite uh, dissimilar from the average consumption pattern. Uh, so these are basically uh, are detected as outliers. So we don't really have any labels in this uh, data set. So we basically analyze average patterns, derive the covariance and even uh, vector, and then evaluate the deviation. So uh, it works uh, pretty well. And uh, what we found is that the performance may not be as high as the incremental linear PCA, but somehow, regardless of the, these parameter settings, the performance is really, really uh, stable. And by updating the data pool, uh, replacing old samples with new, we can actually achieve higher uh, data samples. So take a higher uh, performance. And I'll pass on to Sophie to uh, talk about uh, questions. Yeah. <coughs> Why do you care about an outlier? What's the value of the two in an outlier? Yeah, um, very good question. Um, it might be that um, for marketing purposes, uh, we can actually uh, identify a few typical patterns and then we can actually suggest some different pricing models to these users. And potentially, somebody might be actually stealing power. Their profile is entirely black. <laughs> yeah, so we want to detect those patterns as well. And also, some high, high usage patterns. We probably want to actually help them. Uh, uh, what's the best way to do the project to change the field? Uh, or, or they actually they need to actually change their behavior. So, yeah. Right, but um, your learning would help. So. If I understand you correctly, you're, you're learning 
can help you to fix. Let's say it suddenly goes black. Mm. Uh, you're learning to say, ah, oh, no, but these guys have a holiday home, so they're going away at the weekend. They're not actually stealing power. Mm. Would that be a reasonable analogy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 could be that that, that could be that could happen. Uh, at some, uh, so, so yeah, the learning would yeah, so this we, is not we are, anomaly. It's, for it's this, we we try to actually assess the uh, uh, the behavior of individual households. Yeah. Uh, of course, we can also monitor uh, for each individual household uh, the changes over time. Right. And then maybe by gathering several years of data, we can actually uh, read into it uh, to uh, and derive some behavior that we can cover the so I'm going to allow it. Right. Thanks, Jeremiah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sophie, and a final year uh, PhD student from Information Science. And today I'm going to uh, uh, explain the research that I've done so far. So, two and a half years ago, when I started my PhD, I wanted to work with uh, energy harvesting sensor nodes. Basically, the idea of energy uh, harvesting sensor nodes is to use renewable source of energy instead of battery to power sensors. So, two things is, uh, are important. First one is uh, what kind of uh, renewable energy we need to use. And also, what is the application that this sensor is going to uh, work with? As a renewable source of energy, we use uh, energy um, generated from human motion. And for application, uh, we chose uh, human variables. And uh, the challenge for uh, with working uh, for with um, energy harvesting uh, sensors or uh, renewable energy is on predictable characteristics of renewable source of energy. For example, energy generated from human motion varies uh, from long hours of sitting to running on a treadmill and then uh, cooking and uh, different behaviors generate different amounts of energy. So two things are important. First, we want to know how uh, energy generated and how much energy we can generate from human motion, and uh, also whether this energy is enough to power a fitness gadget and run a fitness gadget entirely. So we started with data analysis. Uh, we analyzed uh, two data sets. The first one is NHAN data set, which contains over 200 hours of acceleration signals from five participants' daily routine. As you can see in this uh, Table. Most of the participants are students, so common activity is commuting to office, going out for lunch, attending meetings, and working on a computer. So pretty much sedentary life is that. Um, so we have the acceleration signal of these participants, and uh, we need to calculate the power, the generated power by their motion. So to do so, we use this uh, VDRG, VDRG uh, harvester, which uh, can be modeled as a second order mass spring system. And uh, we uh, calculate the power using this equation and we implement this equation using the MATLAB simulator. We also uh, divide human daily routine into mind and intense activity because uh, human daily routines uh, contains uh, different activities and we wanted to have a better understanding of the activities. And uh, we consider walking as the, the beginning of intense activity. Uh, this table shows energy generated by the participants in mind and intense activity. Uh, as you can see, the maximum energy, uh, maximum power that is generated is around uh, 3 microwatt per participant to in mind activity. And uh, in intense activity is uh, 112 microwatt 
by participant part, which is obviously not enough to uh, run a fitness gadget constantly with this power. So we need to think of energy management and somehow manage the power that we have effectively. We use a lot of large number and the central limit theorem to uh, calculate the time needed to uh, store enough energy to run the gadget. So the idea is that the fitness gadget is asleep most of the time and then until uh, it has enough energy and then it wakes up transmit the collect data, transmit the data, and then go back to sleep uh, until the next period. And we evaluate our model by proposing a, a, a fitness application. And uh, we assume basic fitness gear, which is composed of a uh, heart rate monitor sensor, accelerometer and temperature sensor, a GPS and n receiver to transmit collected information. This is the table uh, containing uh, that uh, the usage of these sensors, power usage of these sensors, and their active time. We can see that GPS consumes energy more than any other of the sensors, but GPS is kind of, uh, we consider GPS as an emergency sensor, so it is deactivated all the time and will be activated only in the case of emergencies such as heart attack. And it also uses external battery um, in order to be sure that it has always energy, enough energy to be activated in the case of emergency. And uh, also, we uh, assume that heart rate monitor is not activated in my activity because most of the time uh, it doesn't change much in my activity. This is the based on this formula and uh, fitness gadget energy consumption. Uh, we are able to calculate time needed to. Um, uh, store enough power to run the gadget. So, for example, first participant needs around 23 minutes to store enough power to run the gadget, which is quite a lot. And but the uh, second participant needs around four minutes in mild activity to uh, store enough power to run the gadget. This is obviously because second participant uh, generates more power than the first one. And uh, most of the activity of uh, these two participants were the same, except that participant two used to uh, walk to the office rather than take a train or coming by car. Mm -hmm. So we encourage people to walk. To yeah, that's, really, that's, that's really relevant because we've got you know, people doing research on active transport. Uh, yeah. 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 That's fascinating. And uh, this is the result for intense activity, which is more promising. In intense activity, uh, we uh, kind of uh, consider two kind of uh, some scenarios, two scenarios. But the first one is that uh, the idea is to customize to design a fitness ga uh, gadget, which is customized to participant movements. For example, uh, participant five needs eleven seconds to. Uh, power to generate more power to run the gadget in this uh, scenario. Second scenario is uh, that the idea is to uh, design a energy, uh, design a fitness gadget that can be used by all the participants, more of the general scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, we need 21 seconds to store enough energy to run the gadget. 
then uh, we move to our second data set, which is the largest inertial central gate data set. Uh, this is the walking data set, so participants were asked to, uh, there are in total 745 participants in this data set, and participants were asked to uh, walk to the design test, which has three different ground conditions, flat ground, up slope, and down slope. Um, you can see that the uh, power generated by uh, this data set is much more than um, mild activities, but less than intense activity because uh, we consider walking as the uh, beginning of the intense activity. So intense activity can contain running, jogging, and cycling, which are capable of um, producing more energy. We use the same method to obtain uh, the time needed to gather enough energy to run the fitness gadget. And it is interesting to see that energy generated by walking through the level one and down slope path is quite the same. And the upper slope, uh, then walking through the upper slope path generates a little uh, more energy than. Uh, the other ground condition, and intuitively you can see that the uh, the time that need that that is needed to collect the, the enough energy is somehow similar from 30 seconds to 40 seconds based on the ground condition and also level of confidence of the fitness gadget. For the next part of uh, my research, we focused on uh, buffer management uh, because variables are limited in size and weight. So we want to have a, a big enough battery that is capable of um, uh, storing enough power to minimize the deflation. And also we want it to be a light and not heavy. And also, we need to consider the relationship between power, uh, between energy and data, where we want to model uh, and uh, buffer management. Because data transmission rate depends on the availability of the energy. So, with that in mind, we decided to employ a queuing theory to uh, model energy and data behavior. There are different queuing models that we can use, but uh, we wanted to focus in simple model, uh, which gives us uh, which gives us the uh, closed form equation of battery capacity. So we can choose uh, ML1 queuing model, and uh, we assume that we have a battery which is capable of uh, storing up to a K energy packet, and energy packet is a, is a required energy that we need to store uh, to transmit one data packet. This is the schematic view of battery and data buffer. So as you can see, uh, energy arrives and stores in the battery until it is full, and then uh, it's, uh, it will be consumed if there is any data available to be transmitted. Similarly, uh, data arrives at data buffer, and it uh, will be transmitted if there is enough energy at the system. Using the uh, equation of n one queuing model, we were able to um, calculate and obtain the optimal battery capacity, considering minimizing the energy deflation. Here's the result. This is the um, uh, battery capacity with regards to the ratio of data arrival to energy arrival. Um, you can see that as this ratio gets bigger, we need the better, we need larger batteries, which means that in an application with high data rates, we need a battery that is capable of uh, generating. Uh, sorry, uh, storing uh, between 20 
250 energy packets depending on uh, the probability of deflation. And in our model, we wanted to uh, calculate a close one equation of the battery, uh, cap battery capacity. So we needed to assume that data buffer is in the capacity of data buffer is infinite. So we use simulation to find out how big this infinite value. And um, in, in the simulation, data and energy uh, are all the queues, and uh, data will be transmitted if there is enough energy in the system. And we ran the simulation for 1,000 hours, and uh, this is a plot plot box of data buffer size that uh, is needed in uh, energy harvesting sensor. You can see that most of the half of the data needs two point between 2.8 and 3.7 megabytes of uh, buffer size, and uh, maximum in maximum we need 4.5 megabytes of data buffer size, which is reasonable for sensors. So, in conclusion, first of all, uh, our finding shows that only low rate application are realistic for uh, sports here, especially the sedentary buffer size. Uh, and uh, more effective harvesting mechanism are necessary uh, because uh, with uh, with the nowadays harvest, there only 20% of the movement can be generated and uh, can be um, converted to the electricity. So we need a better harvesting mechanism. And as Jeremiah mentioned, uh, this uh, work was submitted, uh, represented in ICNAC conference last year and then uh, were uh, selected to we submitted in uh, as a journal a special issue, and the uh, last part of our work, the buffer management, is submitted to ITPI MRC, which is in October. Thank you. Any questions?